So um, welcome to the Warm Boundary Layer Process Working Group Breakout. Uh, we've got a pretty packed session today. So the agenda consists of, I think, 14 mini talks, updates. I know there were a number of breakout sessions that people had hoped to do and uh, that we weren't able to do in the format of the meeting. So uh, we wanted to give people a chance to, to give updates. Um, talks about the research and there are three slides only and we'll advance the slides for those. A um, bit of logistics in a minute. Uh, and then after that, we'll have short updates from, uh, from some uh, people um, on uh, some of the breakout sessions um, and also uh, on other things. Um, they'll also be five minutes each. Uh, and then at the end, we'll have a discussion on this uh, Cloud Process uh, Measurement Science Group um, uh, from Christine Chu. Uh, we'll talk about the matrix. And then if there's any time left at the end, we may have some open discussion, but we're pretty short on time. Um, we'll uh, advance the slides for the presenters. Um, I'm suggesting I'll put a timer on and give an, uh, a warning at three minutes. Uh, there's a total of five minutes. So anytime beyond three minutes and then you're limiting time for questions, please. Um, we're suggesting that people use the Q&A for, for uh, discussion on the presentations. Um, chat will be is also available but we prefer and i'll try to monitor that but try to use the q a for questions uh at the end we or if you have general discussion points you want to raise um you can use the the chat that are uh, as well um calling attendees can raise their hands uh and you can also raise your hand uh, we could promote you to speak but we prefer in the interest of time to go through the q a and i can ask or you know, ask the questions that people uh, submit. Um, Yunyan, do you want to um, say anything about the uh, AGU session? Yeah, so for the uh, land atmosphere uh, cloud interaction um, that we usually have breakouts in the past years that for this year that uh, we have a AGU session open now. Um, the title is Land Atmosphere Interaction from Bad Talk to uh, Boundary Layer. This is uh, uh, co-hosted by uh, me, Heng Xiao, and Larry Berg. Um, and we are collaborating with uh, NASA people and university colleagues on this session. So um, it may be listed under hydrology, but cross-listing under atmospheric sciences. Just let you know, yeah. And uh, shall we start? Yeah, let's start. So Yunyan's gonna do the introductions and I'll be the timer. Yeah, well, our, first, uh, our first speaker is Yu Tong Zheng from University of Maryland on decoupling of stratocumulus top boundary layer. Yu Tong? Yeah, please can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about decoupling of the stratocumulus top boundary layers, and I'm going to focus on the importance of the horizontal temperature of actions. And so this work is motivated by the fact that um, most of the previous studies on the decoupling of the marine boundary layer are in conditions of the cold air evacuations, which means that the clouds are being evacted uh, from cold to warm water. Uh, but what has been less studied is the opposite situations, which is clouds being evacuated from uh, warm to cold water, or we call it cold, uh, warm air evacuations. Uh, so last year we have paper in JGR, which uh, in which we use the data from the Marcos field campaigns over the Southern Oceans, and to look at a couple of, of uh, warm air vacuum events, and we we have found that uh, the clouds in warm air air vacuums are ex are completely decoupled from surface fluxes. So here, the decoupling means real decoupling, not, not the cumulus couple type of decoupling, as we, we have been talking about in subtropical oceans. So what I'm going to talk about today is more like a generalization of that case studies. So here, we have collected a large group of samples, not only from the Mar Mar uh, Mar Marcos, but also over the ENA and also the Magic Field campaigns. And this large group of data, you know, encompasses a large range of temperature vectors, ranging from the 
extremely cold air evictions to warm air evictions. So this allows us to systematically look at how the boundary layer decoupling responds to the changes in the low level temperature evictions. So for the interest of time, I'm just going to show you one single figure here to, to encapsulate the key finding from this uh, studies. So on the right, you see the figure and on the Y axis is the thermal stratification of the boundary layer. Uh, so more stratification means stronger decoupling. On the X axis is the boundary layer depths and all the uh, data are stratified by the uh, temperature evictions. So the, uh, the red means warm air evictions, the light blue means cold air evictions, and deep, uh, deep, 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 deep blue means extremely cold air evictions. So the key finding here is that for a given boundary layer depth, increase in the temperature evictions causes stronger decoupling degree. So which means that the boundary layer is more decoupled in warm air evictions than in cold air evictions. So this uh, um, results just show, shows us a more complete picture for, un for understanding the decoupling because we often call the boundary layer in the subtropical downstream oceans decoupled. But however, those so-called decoupled boundary layer is still more coupled uh, than those in the warm air of actions if we think of them within the entire spectrum of the temperature of action. Three minutes. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to skip this. If you want to know detail, you can erase the pay paper, which has been accepted in GRL. Next slide, please. Uh, for the future work, so we are running larger simulations to elucidate the physical mechanisms. And also we plan to use the cold air outbreaks observations from the COMBO few campaign to, to further examine our finding. Finally, um, we all know that decoupling can have a, a, a strong influence on the aerosol cloud interactions. But what I think, what, what we re re really need to know is what causes the, the decoupling in the first place. So our study showed that decoupling is always associated with, temp with tem tem temperature evictions. And we all know that temperature evictions uh, ties closely with the large scale vertical velocities and a long range transport of aerosols. So this kind of strong coupling between the large scale dynamics, PBL structure and the clouds should be seriously considered when we study the aerosol cloud interaction. And with this, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't think I see any questions at this point. Um, and we're out. That's exactly five minutes. So uh, let's move on to the next presentation, please. OK, hi, everybody. Um, today I'm talking about a, a new climatology of shallow cumulus bulk entrainment at SGP. This is a collaboration with Katya Lamer of Brookhaven. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, one slide up. OK, so uh, our approach is to take, use two different methods um, to sort of get complementary, complementary pictures of, of what's happening. And the first method is a simple parcel method where basically an entraining parcel model is fit such that the level of neutral buoyancy matches the cloud top height. So it's about as simple of a retrieval as you can imagine. And uh, we have 2021 individual shallow cumulus clouds. There's certain criteria they have to meet, so it's not every cloud. Um, they have to be surface-based, cloud tops less than five kilometer and uh, greater than 250 meter depth. And the sensitivities that you see here, I'm only going to talk about a few of them. Uh, what you see on the horizontal axis is the environmental parameter being ver uh, that varies. And on the, uh, on the ordinate is the fractional entrainment rate. And the strong sensitivities are with CAPE, uh, it's a positive sensitivity, so more CAPE, more entrainment, and also relative humidity, uh, more uh, higher relative humidity, more entrainment, and then a negative sensitivity to cloud depth. I mean, that's kind of what everyone would expect, that uh, clouds that entrain less uh, just send deeper. Next slide, please. The second method, uh, we have a lot less data. This is based on a paper by Druk et al. in 2019. It's a it's an energetics method where it's assumed that um, processes uh, that the energization of entrained air in a cloud 
Um, that process scales with other energ energetic terms in the TKE equation. Um, so this come, a simple equation comes out for entrainment uh, that's it's sensitive to cape to the one third, cloud-based mass flux to the two third, and cloud depth. Um, and this is applied to cloud ensembles. And there are very much fewer of them than there are individual clouds. So we only have 128 of them. So the data doesn't look as great. Um, but what we see is, again, we have a positive sensitivity to K, but the poor R squared, but we know from the equation that that, that sensitivity is real. Um, and we recover the positive sensitivity to relative humidity from the other method. Um, and this negative sensitivity to cloud depth and also a strongly negative sensitivity to cloud-based mass flux. So we learned something new with this that um, at least according to this uh, method, there's a strong negative sensitivity to cloud-based mass flux, more mass flux, less entrainment. Uh, next slide, please. It's uh, two minutes left. Okay. So just to conclude, we have uh, two simple retrievals, but they give different perspectives on shallow cumulus entrainment. One's for individual clouds, one's for cloud ensembles. Um, we see some robust sensitivities in both methods to environmental cape and relative humidity. And I think both of these, I mean, if I'm going to take a, 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 a shot at explaining it, you can think of it in a buoyancy sorting kind of perspective where if the cloud has more potential for buoyancy, then it can also withstand more entrainment. So it tends to entrain more. Uh, there's a negative sensitivity to um, cloud depth and cloud-based mass flux. And also in one of the methods, we saw a positive sensitivity to vertical wind shear. The other method uh, didn't show anything significant. So there's a lot of future work. Um, really want to understand these sensitivities better using uh, possibly machine learning, dimensional analysis, implement another retrieval and do the same at the ENA site. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but there is one hand up, Melissa Miller. I've un you should be able to unmute. Am I, uh, can you hear me? I'm not Melissa. It's Mark Miller. I, Melissa's my student. Oh. I, <laughs> <laughs> I thought I didn't recognize the name. Yeah. yeah sorry about that. Uh, I have no idea how that happened. Um, at any rate, I just wondered for, for you, Tong, uh, you know, we've shown in some of the modeling studies in ENA, at least it's been suggested that when the, when the boundary layer becomes completely decoupled, that, that CTEI, cloud top entrainment instability, tends to really start to control uh, the cloud structure. And this is just in a bunch of simulations, so we, we don't really know how accurate that is. But I wondered if you've thought about that and have you looked at that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. We haven't looked at that yet. Uh, because from uh, the first step we are doing here is to look at the decoupling uh, and its response to the um, temperature vections. And for the cloud pro properties, it's more like our second step, but that's a very good question that I, we will look at there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so let's move on to the next presenter, please. Hey, Cougar. Okay. So our project is a, an attempt to do ground-based remote sensing retrievals of entrainment rates in stratocumulus top boundary layers. Okay, next slide. The method is, is a variation of the well-known uh, flux jump relation. This method is normally used with uh, aircraft, which of course are quite expensive. Uh, this method, it uh, is possible to do it in principle from ground-based measurements. The equation that applies for liquid water fluxes is shown here, and it involves the <clears throat> turbulent and precipitation flux, including cloud droplet sedimentation flux of liquid water and the, the more typical jumps of radiative flux and also thermodynamic jumps across the uh, inversion layer. This is a generalization of a flux jump method uh, proposed by or derived by Wang and Albrecht 1986. Uh, but this method, as far as I know, has not been previously used because the liquid water flux is difficult to measure. Okay, next. So to see if this method in principle works, 
We applied it to a very convenient set of 25 LES simulations of Stratocumulus LES performed by Van der Dusen. These, uh, the 25 vary in their cloud top jumps. And just to give you an example, the uh, turbulent fluxes of cloud water are shown in the five uh, panels on the right. When we apply this method to various levels, for each level, we get a result like that shown in the lower left. And the, the, for this level, which is just below cloud top, the correlation is very good with the LES derived entrainment rate. And the uh, mean value is just a little bit lower. And actually the RMS is basically the same as the, the, uh, the, the ratio difference between that and one. Now a question comes up uh, whether the, the retrieve fluxes could be useful near cloud base and and they can once you get about 80 meters above cloud base and of course from cloud top on down they're quite useful too. You can see the high correlations and low errors uh, persisting. So what this means is that from this retrieval, we could get a number of uh, levels and hopefully get a consensus. Okay, next and last slide. Okay, so far we have just uh, started on this and these are our first look at some results using the, the retrievals from uh, Pavlos Coleus. And the actual retrievals for a 12 hour period are shown on the left. Uh, this is every 10 seconds. And the derived quantities are shown on the right. Again, this is just a first look. Uh, I'll come back to the liquid water flux, but you can see the cloud fraction, average liquid water content, and so on. Now the liquid water flux, we actually, this is in the up, middle, upper. We expect that to be positive everywhere in the cloud, but it's negative in the lower part here. And that is because the vertical velocity is very sensitive to the separation between the drizzle droplets and cloud droplets. And the lower part of the cloud, just a few drizzle droplets can contaminate the vertical velocity. That's it. Great, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm not seeing any questions or hands raised right now. Uh, I suggest we just go on to the next presentation. Thank you. Next speaker is um, uh, Francisca Glasnier. Okay, Francisca, thanks. Are you ready? Yeah. Yes. So, well, I want to talk um, about the liquid water path response or adjustment to aerosol in non precipitating stratocumulus. And this cartoon here on the top of the slide actually illustrates the process chain by which aerosol can invoke such a response. So uh, first as usual, the introduction of additional aerosol leads to more but smaller, drop, smaller droplets. So this is the Turmi effect. And then actually the point is that these smaller droplets actually enhance evaporation and entrainment. And this leads to a reduction in liquid water path in response to more aerosol. Um, and I have illustrated this here by the cloud getting thinner. And to quantify this effect, we can consider the sensitivity of LWP to um, cloud droplet number N. Um, and I've illustrated the sensitivity by the steepness of the slopes in the LWP N plot. And now it's actually debated how um, strong this effect is um, in a general sense. And the reason for this is mainly that when we look at chip track studies, which I have drawn here in pink, then um, they give very different results than climatological sat satellite studies, which are shown here in black. And so the climatological results seem to suggest a rather strong effect, so strong even that we touch um, on this orange region, which I have titled warming. And the reason here is that in the orange area, more aerosol actually leads to less reflective stratocumulus because the cloud thinning overcompensates um, the cooling effect from the true brightening. And in contrast to this, the ship track studies suggest that there is almost no cloud thinning such that we would get the full true brightening and cooling. And what I want to discuss today basically is that we can understand this discrepancy when we um, take into account that this um, liquid water path adjustment um, actually evolves on a rather long time scale. Next slide, please. 
And actually, we find that this time scale is about 20 hours. So th that is to say that unlike the Trumi effect, which takes effect almost immediately, it uh, takes a time scale of 20 hours for this cloud thinning to become effective. And um, to derive this time scale, we actually combine an ensemble of large eddy simulations with um, uh, the technique of Gaussian process emulation to then obtain a dynamical systems description of the stratocumulus field. And from this description, we can then theoretically derive this time scale. Obviously, I have no time to go into this, but have to refer you, refer you to our preprint. But what I still would like to explain is what kind of data we need to perform this analysis. And this you can see on the left. So on the left, each of the lines is a single large eddy simulation. And they basically are um, combined time series of um, the evolution of cloud droplet number n and liquid water power. So with this, we can go to the next slide. There's two minutes left. Yeah. Um, and um, now we can see how this um, time scale of 20 hours can explain this discrepancy we saw between the climatological retrievals and the ship tracks. And the key here is to compare this to the lifetime of the system that we are looking at. So when we think about the stratocumulus, then we, we, we have something like a Lagrangian lifetime of days. So there is ample time for the liquid water path to adjust to the specific aerosol background. But in contrast, when we have a ship, a ship track, then they have an average lifetime of three hours, which is much shorter than the adjustment time scale. And this basically means that the aerosol perturbation dissolves before adjustments can fully take effect. So um, based on this, we can say that the weak um, liquid water path adjustments observed in ship tracks are due to the fact that they have such a short lifetime. And we can also make this um, more quantitative, uh, which is shown in the plot below, where we predict a much weaker adjustment after three hours than after the climatological value, uh, climatological duration of um, 48 hours. Um, yeah, and I think um, with this, I should be close to my three minutes. And as a very brief summary or take home, I want to make the statement that I think we, we, we show that liquid water path adjustments and non-precipitating stratocumulus clouds matter, especially in terms of their climatological forcing because they are a warming effect that needs to be taken account, into account. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. I had just one question of why why the aerosol perturbations last less time in ship tracks than in the normal environment, whatever you want to call that, the climatological? Um, just because the ship track, the, the perturbation just um, diffuses away, right? It's a relatively small amount, which is then diffused away. Whereas for the climatological situation, we, we think about just, just a region of a steady cumulus deck, which has a certain amount of aerosol, and then it evolves further. So it's not kind of this punctual increase that one is interested in, but just the general background that is present. And this background would be different, is the assumption, in an anthropogenically perturbed climate as compared to a pristine climate Great. on average. Thank you. Uh, I think there's a Q&A for you you might want to address. Um, let's move on to the next presentation. Our next speaker is Jim Hudson on inhomogeneous mixing effects. Jim? Well, inhomogeneous mixing was introduced to try to explain warm rain, warm precipitation by reducing droplet concentrations. And this should result in drizzle forming in parts of the cloud that have lower liquid water contents. And this should mean a negative correlation between the liquid water content and the uh, mean diameter uh, of the dro cloud droplets. And so we investigated this in a post project off California, Stratus Clouds, and we found only about when we ran running correlations, so we got just about every second in 146 different uh, horizontal cloud passes. Only 4.6% of those cases were negative out of 34,000 or so seconds. It does get more inhomogeneous, higher in the cloud as expected, but as you can see the frequency diagram over here on the right, uh, it's mostly tending toward extreme homogeneous or adiabatic situation. Next slide. However, uh, many of the uh, characteristics of clouds also vary with the distance from cloud base, the height, or the distance from cloud top, which I call the depth. So in order to try to untangle this, we divide the data into various depth here, depth uh, ranges, 41, 
and look at the correlations of the various variables, mean diameter, cloud droplet concentration, and drizzle drop, uh, drizzle drop concentration, and compare that with the correlation uh, with the, uh, of the depth with R, L sub C, and D as a normalization, uh, sort of a, a body, get rid of the bias. And that's the red. The black is the important one. Mean diameter has a negative correlation, which means larger, drop, larger droplets when it's more inhomogeneous. Fewer droplets when it's more inhomogeneous is the middle figure. The black is on above the uh, R0. And the bottom figure for drizzle is negative. So it is indicating inhomogeneous mixing, uh, doing what it's supposed to do. But we have to remember that uh, CCN also have this same effect. If you have variations in CCN, they will also produce this negative correlation. And indeed, in that project, we had a lot of variation among flights of the CCN. Next slide. So the, if we look at all the data, like in the last diagram, so all 15 flights, yes, we do get the negative correlation for mean diameter, positive for droplet concentration, negative for drizzle. But when we start classifying the flights into commonality, nighttime, daytime, polluted, clean, especially in N sub C, we get uh, some contraindications. And when we look at each flight, uh, we get a lot more contraindications. So the CCN are not having so much of an effect when we're just looking at one flight rather than the entire 15 flights. So it's difficult to untangle things. And, uh, but we have actually been able to look at individual parts of clouds and do find a little more precipitation where the inhomogeneous mixing uh, criteria seem to fall. Uh, that's enough. Right. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions. The questions seem to be coming in generally after uh, the presenters. Um, so there are questions open for Francesca and Steve, by the way. Um, one for Dan in the chat as well. So you might want to look at those. Um, let's move on to the next presentation, please. Our next speaker is uh, Maria Candadu talking about the partition of uh, liquid water pots. Maria? Yeah? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm going to talk about some work that uh, Virendra and I have been doing to uh, try to uh, better understand the liquid water path of lightly precipitating clouds. And uh, um, on the left, uh, I'm showing uh, um, the current uh, uh, assumption that we use for retrieving liquid water path in uh, uh, precipitating clouds, where we assume that the liquid water the liquid water path is entirely located in the cloud, and we neglect the drizzle condition, and we assume that the entire condensating in the cloud, and this leads to an overestimation of the uh, liquid water path in the cloud. And on the right, I'm showing a new proposed methodology where uh, we are uh, using a, a synergy of passive and active sensors to have information on the um, drizzle microphysics first, and then use that microphysical information in a um, radiative transfer calculation where we account for the scattering from the uh, drizzle drops on the microwave radiation. And uh, uh, by using that information in the uh, microwave retrieval, uh, we can uh, uh, gain information on the partition of the cloud and the drizzle liquid water path. And in the right side, I'm showing the sort of summary of the retrieval scheme, but I'm not gonna get into the details of that for now. And so we can just go to the next slide. And here I'm just showing some examples of results. Uh, on the top is a um, sample of one day of the uh, output from the active module of the retriever. 
where we derive the macrophysical properties so the, uh, of size distribution and liquid water content of the drizzle. And then uh, we use that information in the uh, radiative transfer code. And uh, on the bottom uh, left, uh, I show what we get from the um, uh, passive um, module of the retriever where we uh, are able to uh, attribute the, um, essentially the contribution from the cloud liquid water path and the drizzle liquid water path to the microwave uh, uh, signal. And uh, um, since we do retrieve the uh, liquid water path of the drizzle below the cloud base from the active sensors, then we are able to separate the below cloud and above cloud uh, uh, drizzle water path. And as we can see uh, from the blue line in the bottom plot, the contribution of the drizzle liquid water path is actually non negligible and it is well uh, in the sensitivity of the microwave radiometer, certainly of the 90 gigahertz channel. So we do think that we are actually getting real information, uh, we are pretty sure, from the uh, drizzle uh, liquid water path in the cloud. And uh, um, an additional uh, uh, result here is that uh, therefore by including the um, drizzle information in the retrieval, uh, the amount of the cloud liquid water path is reduced. And uh, uh, here uh, is shown on the right a scatter plot of uh, uh, liquid water path when we do not include scattering. And with the scattering included, and the reduction of the liquid water path uh, is about uh, um, eight to 15%, um, depending on the cloud uh, um, uh, total liquid water path. And uh, uh, this can amount uh, in absolute term, uh, as we can see from the scatter plot, to up to about 100 grams per square meter of cloud uh, uh, liquid water path that we are overestimating if we do not uh, include the scattering information during precip uh, light precipitation. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide, the conclusion, where we show we uh, ongoing work. So we have processed about uh, four years of uh, uh, data at the ENA with the active module, and uh, we have selected about uh, 56 cases that we are processing with the um, passive module. And so we hope to get uh, a nice uh, data set of cloud drizzle and in cloud drizzle liquid water path and as well as microphysical uh, property to turbulence property. And uh, uh, we are hoping to uh, put together a nice ensemble of data um, uh, for uh, uh, aerosol and drizzle interaction study. And uh, if anybody's interested in knowing more, um, I've listed just a bit of the recent publication that are the background, so to speak, for the work that we are doing. Thank you, Maria. Um, there is a question for you, I think, in the uh, by Zishuan Dong in the in the Q and A, but I think we're going to have to move on now to the next yeah. presenter. Okay, I'll go there then. Well, thank you. Yeah, our next speaker is Xue Zheng talking about assessment of ESRSM version one. Thanks, Ling Yan. Uh, I'd like to update our research on the assessment of precipitating marine stratocumulus clouds in ESRSM V1 uh, with uh, our magic field campaign data and related LES simulations. I reported uh, the uh, preliminary results last year in arm ASR meeting. After that, we did a more uh, in-depth uh, model diagnostics and uh, sensitivity tests and identified the, the mechanisms that cause um, the problems in the simulations. Now this study has been published on um, a, a monthly weather review and I'd like to acknowledge all the co-authors. Uh, next slide, please. Briefly speaking, um, these studies try to uh, evaluate the physical parameterization of E3SM version one under a well-constrained large-scale environment. So we use the single column model approach and compare with LES and ARM observations. 
Uh, the main findings include um, the single column model uh, realistically represents the evolution of clouds and boundary layer structures during the stratocumulus to cumulus transition as shown in the um, upper right panel. And although the boundary layer might be um, deepening to um, late or too weak, we find our increase the vertical, a further increase vertical resolution can improve that. But uh, uh, each SM already have pretty high vertical resolution. Um, so we can say if we have a good large scale environment, um, user SM has a good capacity to simulate the stratocumulus clouds and even the transition. On the other hand, we find out some model issues in the precipitation features uh, for these cl uh, cloud regimes. Uh, it includes uh, unrealistically um, uh, sub-cloud precipitation fraction and a double peak in the vertical uh, precipitation structure as shown in the uh, right bottom panel. And, and the drizzles uh, evaporates too close to the uh, surface. Um, we identify that it's due to overly long microflex time step and uh, unrealistic parameterization of the precipitation fractions. You can find more details in the uh, paper if you are interested in. And next slide, please. That's uh, two so, minutes remaining. Mm -hmm. um, now we are currently working on improve the framework, uh, including the ARM data and single column model and the LES. Um, we plan to um, extend our study to use a long-term record uh, over ENA side and the related LES simulations. Another uh, thing we are doing is collaborating with uh, ESUS and model team to test the climate impacts of those suggested modification based on our findings. With that, I don't like to take any question or comments uh, online or offline. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shui. Um, I don't currently see any questions at this point. Um, so let's move on to the next presenter. Our next speaker is Sasha Marshan talking about cloud edge properties. Sasha? Just a second. Okay, good afternoon. Yes, and I'll be talking about cloud edge property over ocean and land using shortwave spectrometer. And once, so this first, I make kind of a summary what I'm going to talk about. And one second resolution data from the ARM shortwave spectrometer provide a unique opportunity to study cloud edge property or the transition zone between cloudy and clear areas. So this is the first point. Second, to study the transition zone, we have developed a new radiative transfer technique called spectral invariant method for analyzing high spectral and temporal resolution observations of shortwave radiation. And we applied it to both warm boundary layer clouds over land, SGP, and uh, over ocean using magic campaign. And um, the third point, comparing the SGP site and the magic campaign cases, our results showed that while cloud optical depth decreases towards cloud edge for both cases, the decrease of droplet size is much more pronounced over land, it's South Great Plant, than over ocean magic. Next slide, please. So one of the strongest mechanisms affecting cloud processes a cloud air entrainment and mixing in the transition zone. Two limiting scenarios of homogeneous and inhomogeneous mixing can be used to describe them. Homogeneous mixing results in a drier air penetration into cloud before cloud drops begin to evaporate. So this is the left figure and um, 
it leads to reduction of size of all droplets. You see the same number of droplets, but smaller size, and no substantial change in their number concentration. In contrast, weak in, with inhomogeneous mixing, evaporation begins before dry air penetrates the clouds, resulting a reduction of drop size number concentration, but no much change in drop size. And, um, and one second, so right slide, one second resolution observation from short wave spect spectrometer, SAS Z, so Zenit radiance, short wave array spectrometer, then it's it calls. Very good for studying cloud edge property. And they, why? Because they capture the needed temporal and spatial resolution, which are difficult to measure from space-based and aircraft platform. The cloud model by Pinsky and Kane suggest that broadening of droplet dis size distribution towards cloud edges. And we confirm it with the SGP and magic cloud edge data analysis. And we found that optical depth decreases towards cloud edge in all cases. But uh, the inhomogeneous mixing is much more pronounced over ocean than over land. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is on the left upper plot. It's example of SAS Z zenit radiance measurements for cloudy upper curve and clear sky. And the spectrally invariant approximation uses the fact that the spectrum in the transition zone and uh, can be represented by a linear combination of adjacent cloud, cloud uh, of adjacent cloudy and clear zone. So, and um, spectra, and uh, assuming that both cloudy and clear spectra is well known, and uh, <clears throat> by normalizing it by the spectrum of clear radiance, we get a, a linear relationship. And the relationship results in linear properties like slope A of T of time or intercept B of time. So it's upper plots. And they're spectrally invariant. So you see, they don't depend on lambda and depends only on adjacent cloudy and clear sky property. That's five minutes. Can we? Can we wrap up, please? Yes, yes. One of the advantages of uh, this proposed technique is a weak sensitivity to aerosol properties and surface property. And um, so we selected 22 cases, and this is an example of a cloudy and clear sky transmission for, for visible and near infrared. And our future work, so and flat, future plans. So we <clears throat> want to understand sources of particle changes ranging from aerosol swelling in humid air, detriment of cloud process art particles into cloud free environment and presence of undetected clouds. And so we did it with the Israeli team from Hebrew University and we used their model and um, we want to improve cloud aerosol interaction and mixing the Descri description in the vicinity of cloud edge. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I think we're going to have to uh, move along. Uh, next presenter, please. Our next uh, uh, speaker is Jake uh, Grace T talking about shallow cumulus readings. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name is Jake Grace T. I'm a research scientist at Ceres and NOAA. And together with my collaborators listed in the top right here, we've been looking at uh, solar irradiance variability uh, under shallow cumulus clouds. So what I'm showing here is one particular example from the ARM SGP site. Uh, in the top left, you see the total sky image is showing that we're in a shallow cumulus regime. Um, 
And directly below, I'm, I'm showing the observed probability density function of the solar irradiance that reaches the surface. And what you can see is that there's clearly a, a bimodal shape there. So um, there's a mode at smaller irradiance associated with the cloud shadows and a mode at larger irradiance uh, associated with the clear sky between. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, on, on the right hand side here is our large eddy simulation of this case. And, and you see that in the top right, we're able to simulate a, a well developed shallow cumulus field. Um, but in the bottom right, you see that we're only able to capture this uh, bimodal surface irradiance PDF um, if we perform 3D radiative transfer calculations. So in the commonly used uh, 1D radiation schemes, we don't capture this bimodal shape at all. And, and this is consistent across the lasso days at SGP and, and has been documented in the, in the papers listed in the bottom left. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the problem with these 3D radiative transfer calculations is they're extremely expensive. So what we've been looking at recently is, is there a way that we can map directly between the cloud field properties on the left hand side here and this bimodal surface irradiance PDF on the right hand side. Um, so to do this for, for the cloud field properties, we've been looking at radiatively relevant properties, things like the, the cloud fraction, the liquid water path, drop number concentration, uh, and the, the areas and the distances between clouds. Uh, and on the right hand side, to quantify this bimodal irradiance PDF, we've fitted a, a normal distribution to the small irradiance mode uh, with two parameters, a log normal distribution to the larger irradiance mode with three parameters, uh, and a weighting for each of these modes. So this is a case where we, we uh, know the inputs, the cloud field properties, we know the, the outputs, the irradiance PDF fit parameters, and we want to learn the relationship between the two. Uh, this is an ideal case for machine learning algorithms. So uh, we've used a, a random forest and an artificial neural network to do this. Um, and these images are just showing a single snapshot, but um, to build these relationships, we've looked at over 500 cases um, across 500 snapshots across 30 different LES cases. Uh, so does this work? And next slide, please. Uh, so these are the results for the random forest algorithm. And, and in the top right here, this is a prediction for each of these irradiance PDF fit parameters um, on some test data that we held out from the training. And you can see the uh, positive correlations uh, here showing that the model has some predictive skill. Um, but perhaps more visually effective is uh, on the left hand side is four examples of where we've used these predictive parameters to reconstruct the surface irradiance PDF. Um, so the blue lines here are showing the um, the PDF fit that we're using as the truth and the orange dash is the prediction by the random forest and, and you can see that the random forest is capturing the variations in the shape and size of each of these uh, irradiance modes um, and this is really a drastic improvement with respect to the 1D calculations that I showed on the, the first slide. Um, so, so there's several potential applications here and opportunities for collaboration. Um, uh, first of all LES 3D radiation parameterization uh, but also at the NWP scale, we could think about a 3D uh, radiation bias corrections uh, using this method. And also we're implicitly accessing the subgrid radiation variability uh, with these PDFs. Uh, and I'm sure there are other applications here as well. So uh, happy to answer any questions or comments on this. Great. Thank you, Jake. Uh, very interesting. Um, I don't see any current questions right now. There's a question for Sasha in the Q&A if you want to look at that. But uh, why don't we go on to the next presentation? Next speaker is Zhiyun Wang and uh, Haley Xin, talking about one boundary layer synergy between observation and modeling. Thank you. So uh, our team focus on to understanding one boundary layer through modeling and uh, observation analysis. So the modeling team at ANCA is leading by Luni Xue. The center part of this figure shows a general approach. So we try to use arm observation and the lasso simulation, try to better understand the boundary layer clouds. Then we try to use that to evaluate and improve the PBA parameterization in the arm. So as the year one, so we demonstrated this general approach of workings on the left side of the figure show you a new approach to get a mixing layer from double measurements. So we also can use get a PBR top height from Raman LIDAR. So the left figure show you dyno cycle as seasonal changing. You can see there's a lot of this kind of temporal variation which uh, offer a lot of information for us to dig into the process, control this kind of variation. Now, highly we're talking about how we using lasso simulation to better understanding related process 
So all this will be fit into the model evaluation based on single column model simulation of a different PBL parameterization. So Anga team already implemented this different work parameterization into a single model, mode which you can drive with a lasso simulation. So we're looking forward for the year two and the year three. So to use this framework to improve uh, work permutation. So Haile will take it, the rest talk. Thanks, Jian. Uh, yeah. So as a part of this project, uh, we investigated the role of large scale processing on cloud simulation by using graphics provided by Lasso browser and also comparing si simulations for the same Lasso case, but driven by different large scale forcing. So the, our goal is to develop an analysis floor uh, linking the large scale forcing to mean structures and turbulent statistics, and finally for cloud pro properties. So figures in the bottom present an example last case we picked, comparing high skill score simulations and low skill score, score simulations. And compared to observations, the low skill score simulations shown on the center bottom shows a deeper cloud layer, <clears throat> deeper cloud layer, and the major differences between these two simulations are as shown in the bottom right figures the weak inversion strength in this simulation and the excessive moisture contents above the boundary layer in the late afternoon. Next, next slide, please. So the left column shows how high order turbulence statistics respond to different large scale forcing. Focusing on the second column, so it shows that the weak inversion in these low scale score simulations allows how it allows more surface driven updraft to reach higher vertical levels and leading to excessive moisture transport, therefore explaining the deeper cloud layer in the early morning. And move to the right columns, we further investigated the look at the temporal and vertical variations of scales of energy dominant eddies to further understand what different scales of processes are involved with this cloud development. So in this, in this figure, focus on top right figure. So each data it is vertical level and time shows the length scale that explains the, that explains the dominant length scales contribute to the variability at the time and vertical levels. For example, on the top right, from the surface to the cloud top, you can see that the dominant length scales are about the boundary layer scales. On the other hand, in the in case of the moisture in the middle, it shows a sudden increase in the dominant length scale in cloud layer. And this is suggests that the, unlike the vertical motions in the variability of the moisture field is not purely driven by boundary layer at this, but there are larger than boundary layer scales contribute to this. And it's, it, this explains the cloud, which seem to be decoupled from, from the surface in the late afternoon. Next slide, please. So our next step is to link this LES analysis to guide PBL parameterizations using single column models. So in the left figures, we have been working on separating vertical transport in the larger simulations into two components dominated by different scales of motion. So our next question is how these different components would respond to large scale forcing and how well different types of parameterizations reproduce the responses. And as Jian explained, we already have a good progress on this effort too in implementing PBL parameterizations in the single column model on the, on the right bottom, uh, on the right bottom. So this is all I have. And we started wrapping up this result for publication. So any question, comment, and suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Hyeom. Um, I don't see any questions open right now. 
Um, so let's, I suggest we go on to the next presentation. Jing Jing Tian, talking about the land cover effect. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Um, okay. Um, so the continental cumulus cloud are tightly coupled with land. So different land covers like the forest, grass or crops, or even cities may influence the preferential formation of the shallow cube. Uh, in our study, we aim to answer two questions. Um, the first one is, uh, are there any preference of the shallow cube occurrence and cloud size over homogeneous land covers? Um, the second one is, around the heterogeneous land cover boundaries, are there any difference of the shallow cube occurrence and cloud sizes? Uh, in our study, we used the observations from the ARM ground-based sterile cameras, COX, and the geostationary satellite, GOES-R, to study shallow queue. Um, the COX became operational in August 2017, and uh, they can provide accurate cumulus cloud images. And the GOES-R became operational at the end of 2017. Um, the resolutions are about 500 meters and uh, five minutes on which are on the edge to resolve uh, not every, but most of the shallow queue. Uh, our study is focused on shallow queue cases during 2018 to 2019, June, July, August. Uh, to detect the shallow queue, we firstly find a satellite reference threshold to make the core faction estimated from the satellite image as close as the core faction from the cox, and then use this reflectance threshold to distinguish core pixels and non-core pixels on the satellite image, but with a, lot, a little bit larger domain. And then at last, do some clock segmentation to get the core size information. Next slide, please. Um, we may focus on the table first. Uh, as shown in the table, we found the core faction and the core sizes are larger over the homogeneous forest than over the homogeneous grass. Um, this evidence could be related to the differential surface heating. The three figures um, in the upper row, uh, forest in green and the grass in red, uh, show that there are more sensible and latent heat release over forest than over the grass. Uh, so that with a higher PBL and a lower LCL over the forest, um, crop faction and the crop sizes are larger. Uh, still in the table, we found that over the heterogeneous forest and the grass, the core faction and core sizes are larger than those over the homogeneous forest and grass. Uh, the left animation shows an example of the heterogeneous land cover setting mm, with a narrow grass, uh, 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 with a narrow green forest embedded in the red grassland. Uh, in our study, we generate a pair of 10 kilometers wide uh, dark gray moving band and then calculate the mean cross sizes and the core factions in the cross bounding gray areas. And we found the core faction and the core sizes are larger over the heterogeneous forest than over the nearby grass. And also those values are larger over the heterogeneous forest grass boundaries than over the homogeneous forest and grass. So those evidence may indicate a secondary circulation induced from the differential heating by the heterogeneous land covers. And the red panel, red animation, uh, shows an example of the CT, um, Tulsa. Tulsa, uh, the city size is about 20 by 20 kilometers, but we still can see the transition on um, the large core faction and core sizes over the city center, but became smaller at the suburban area. Uh, also over the city, the shallow queue core size and core factions are much larger than those over the forest and grass. And um, that is all what I have for today and uh, welcome any questions. Right, thank you, Jing Jing. Um, I don't see any questions open right now. Um, so why don't we go on to the next presenter. There are a couple of questions for Jake, uh, one in chat and um, one in the, a uh, couple in the, um, couple in the Q&A. Our next speaker is um, Philip Greenwank, talking about size decomposition of shallow cumulus. Hello, I hope you can uh, hear me. 
So yes, I'm Philip Krivank. Uh, this is work I did together with Thijs Hoys and Ruel Nechas. Um, and Neil, who's speaking next, uh, helped us out a lot, or he's part of it. And the basic question we are trying to look at is if shallow cumulus clouds uh, have stronger updrafts and other properties that vary with their size. And the way we tried to address this was sort of a big statistical approach of where we tried to gather lots of LiDAR data from the SGP and compare it with uh, LES from uh, Lasso uh, library also at the SGP site. And the uh, comparison we did was we looked at them uh, by chords. So each cloud that goes over a LiDAR creates a chord. And these chords were then uh, regularized in height and length so that we could make composites of many, many such chords. And this is uh, shown here on this first slide, where on the left you have on 2,000 chord composites taken from LiDAR data showing the vertical velocity. Um, here only chords between 750 and 1,500 meters. And then in the middle, you see the same um, from the model data from column output. And you, for us, at least, these were very happy uh, results where you can see a clear updraft uh, underneath the chord and sort of downdrafts on the side. Uh, and the last panel is actually uh, also model uh, data, but it was just processed differently. So we took the 3D model snapshots and sliced them. And I'll take a quick look at that gray box before we go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, and what's shown in this plot is what is the vertical velocity in those gray boxes beneath the chords um, as a function of chord length. Um, so here the observations are black, uh, the 1D model output is in red, and the size of the dot shows you how many uh, samples we have. And for us, at least, we were quite impressed and quite happy with the results that the model seems to agree quite well with the 1D, uh, with the LiDAR data, and you see a clear scaling um, of the updraft strength with the chord length to about one and a half kilometers. Uh, in contrast, the blue data, which is also from the model and has way, way, way more samples, shows a quite different behavior. Um, and so our main results were that uh, the model's doing pretty well to agree with the, the LiDAR. Um, there is a clear size coupling. And as always, when you're doing a model data comparison, it's really important how you sample your model to agree with the data. Um, this paper is currently going through the ACP discussions. Um, it's in minor revisions. So if you have questions, ask me or read it. Next slide. How am I time wise? Uh, two minutes left. OK, that's good. So ongoing stuff, um, which was asked to be included. So I'm trying to evaluate multi-plume parametrization, specifically the one uh, called EDMFN, which assumes that plumes are different based on their size. And to do so, we're trying to cluster plumes from the LES simulations so that we can then take a look if these assumptions in the parametrization hold. And so far, qualitatively, things look quite good. Um, and just here on the right, snapshot of like, these are all the plumes and uh, scattered by various properties from one single snapshot from a simulation. So this is what I'm currently working on. If you like to interested in this, uh, drop me a line. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, there are a few questions for Jingjing in the in the Q and A, um, and they seem to be coming in typically after after the presenters. So let's go on to the next presentation. Uh, next speaker is Neil Laroe, uh, talking about observe updraft and also include one highlight on a uh, field campaign proposal he just put in. Neil. Okay. Thanks, Shen Yan. Um, so yeah, kind of dovetailing off Philip's talk, I'm going to be talking about um, variation in updraft size and intensity. And in this case, actually looking at variations uh, with height in the subcloud layer, so not just at cloud base. And the motivation here, uh, again, as Philip just highlighted, is the EDMF uh, sort of approach where we're thinking about the um, dominant eddies in the boundary layer, the mass flux eddies uh, as these coherent updraft objects uh, transporting the bulk of the heat and moisture. So we're going to use a large sample of LIDAR observations shown on the right here and use an image processing tool to define updraft objects based on coherent regions of positive vertical velocity. Um, we end up with about 120,000 individual updraft objects, which can each be described uh, by various geometric properties. And in this case, we're going to stratify those data by um, the three quarter height of the updraft object as a rough approximation for where the updraft object is in the boundary layer. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so uh, on the left here, we're going to look at composites of all updraft objects as they ascend through the convective boundary layer. The dashed line shows the boundary layer top. And what we get is a picture that looks a lot like the canonical um, thermal bubble rising, rising through the convective boundary layer. The lower two panels there show on the left the chord length distribution and on the right the vertical velocity distribution at different heights. So the different colored lines are showing different heights. And to borrow a term, uh, we're seeing a flattening of the curve here, where as we ascend through the boundary layer, we get larger and larger populations of wider and wider updrafts. And those wider and wider updrafts also possess stronger and stronger vertical velocities. So we're taking uh, kind of you know, an expanding uh, thermal as, as it rises through the boundary layer. Uh, if you could advance one. Uh, we can also look at the mean and median profiles of this. Um, which on, on the bottom left, uh, you, can, you can see how the vertical velocity varies with height within these updraft objects, as well as how the chord length varies with height. Uh, the chord length variation isn't linear, which is a little bit surprising. If we were treating these just like thermals or plumes, we'd expect the, the radius of the object to essentially vary linearly with height. On the right, we can do the same analysis, but restrict it to what we'll call rooted updraft objects, which are um, stuck to the the, their bottom edge remains closer to the, to the base of the boundary layer. And we see similar distributions here, albeit for these objects, they're much stronger and much wider. And uh, if you advance one, uh, the, the variation, especially with chord length, um, which is the right-hand panel here, is much less linear with height, uh, which suggests there's a nonlinear growth process occurring here, which, which may be evidence of aggregation or kind of merging of multiple uh, individual plumes into larger, more persistent objects. Okay, next slide. Um, and if you can just advance like three, um, maybe keep going, one, two more. Um, just in the, in the interest of time, we can also look at the sensitivity of these profiles on the top, the updraft velocity profile, and on the bottom, the cloud, uh, the chord length profiles. And we can look at their sensitivity to environmental factors. And the ones that I've chosen to look at here uh, and that uh, Courtney Keene, who's working with me on this, has, has examined are the convective velocity scale, which is kind of like the buoyancy forcing for this, and the crosswind scale. And we can actually combine those into a single dimensionless parameter, which is basically the rise over run, the strength of the updraft compared to the strength of the crosswind. And that's shown on the right. And somewhat unsurprisingly, we find a pronounced sensitivity where uh, for a given um, kind of grouping of this W over U parameter, uh, the larger W is relative to U, so the bigger the updrafts relative to the crosswind, uh, the, the stronger the updraft is able to be maintained. And likewise for the chord length, uh, we get wider chord lengths uh, everywhere with height as a function of this parameter. And so just kind of a compact way of representing some of the sensitivity that might be able to uh, be, be plugged into a model uh, something like EDMF to, to impact the, the way we prescribe the size of these. Okay, um, so uh, actually if you can just advance two slides in the interest of time. Um, yeah, we'll skip that one. So uh, just segue here, um, this is all over flat terrain. And so over flat terrain, the EDMF uh, framework makes a lot of sense. Uh, we have these coherent updraft objects transporting a lot of mass over topography. The scenario is more complicated because we have various organized thermally driven flows and mechanical forcing that drives ascent over terrain. And so what I'm advertising here is a proposal that we're, um, we're putting in for an AMF1 deployment called the Vertical Exchange and Convective Initiation over Orography Project. Um, I've listed some of the key science questions here. And this is going to be part of a much larger effort called TMAX, which is an international consortium designed to look at um, these processes using a number of super sites distributed around the Alps in 2023 and or 2024, uh, looking at warm season processes. And so uh, I, I hope to get some feedback from, from people on this as we put the proposal together. Um, and Daniel Kirschbaum, um, who spoke earlier, as well as Stefan DeWecker are uh, closely involved here. So uh, ex expect to hear from me and uh, we'd love to get some feedback on, on how to shape this proposal. Thanks. Great, thanks Neil. There is one question from Larry Berg. Uh, do you have uh, a feel for how wind shear might impact the results? Yeah, great question. Um, 
we, we have looked at this. Characterizing the wind she shear over the depth of boundary layer has proven to be kind of noisy and a little bit difficult. Um, the short answer is that it does tend to vary with the mean wind. Um, the, the, lar the cases with larger mean wind tend to have larger wind shear. And we do see that the updraft strength goes down with increasing uh, wind shear. Surprisingly, very little sensitivity to the updraft cord lengths. Right. Thank you. Um, let's move on to the, uh, that's, thanks everyone for keeping to time there. Uh, we're on time um, with the mini talks. And now we're going to move to the short updates from field campaigns and um, arm infrastructure. Our next speaker is Shao Cheng Xie on the web update for our working group. Uh, thank you, Yuan. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick update on the value added product produced by a group of scientists, actually we called the ARM translator group. Next slide. Yeah, this is a group that helped to bridge uh, the ARM uh, data and also ASR scientists need, specifically to address the uh, data need from the science community. Uh, probably this is the uh, slide, you know, I would like to show to the group, you know, because if you have any data need, you can contact uh, relevant translators. Uh, I'm the translator for uh, the modeling related product. Uh, John Shelling is the translator for ISO. Uh, he's also the translator or the point of contact for Tracer, this field campaign. Uh, da Mao Zhang is our new translator to replace Laura. Uh, he is responsible for, you know, high latitude uh, uh, data product for that working group and also Mosaic. Uh, Scar Collis uh, is for the convective uh, uh, processes working group and also the translator for Cacti. Uh, Scott Girogandi, uh, he is actually the translator for this one boundary working group. Uh, but today he is not able uh, to join the working group breakout session because he's helping the transition of his role to Da Mao Zhang for the la high latitude working group. We also have uh, Krista and Ken to help address any issues relevant to software development and also data quality. Next slide. So uh, this slide gave you uh, some idea what kind of webs we are currently working on. Uh, the goal is to provide the surface side data and the vertical profiles of cloud and the aerosol properties, as well as you know the simultaneous thermodynamics dynamics and the large scale environment. That gave you uh, uh, the uh, complete picture about you know how you know those cloud aerosol interaction, also the large scale environment. Uh, I won't go through all those details. You can, you know, uh, contact, you know, the point of contact uh, if you are interested in some of the web we are developed. Uh, next slide. So one type of data I do want to highlight today is the uh, uh, recently developed the last so high frequency of the vision data led by Scar Geograndi uh, at Brookhaven. Uh, this is the very high frequency data, like you know, I showed in this slide is 10 million frequency. Uh, you can find uh, many important uh, geophysical parameters uh, including in this type of data, uh, such as the lifting condensation uh, level height and cloud phase height uh, and other cloud aerosol information. So, so uh, the data can be obtained, you know, uh, from the lasso bundle data release. Uh, the data is uh, available for 2019. If you have uh, any uh, questions on this data, please contact Scar Geograndi. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, we are also working on to address, you know, the data issues and uncertainties. Uh, we know this is uh, something really needed from the community, uh, but it's very challenging. We are not able to, you uh, know, uh, quantify all the uncertainties for the ARM data, you know, for, uh, so uh, because uh, it's also involved a lot of scientific challenge. So one way we plan to do is like we try to develop a one-page web description. This is some feedback we got from last year ARM uh, ASR meeting. Uh, 
in this one page description, we are going to provide a brief description about the life with the emphasis on the data issues and the algorithm, you know, issues. Uh, at least gave you some rough idea, you know, when you use the data, which period the data probably more reliable than others, what kind of uncertainties uh, in the algorithm we use to derive the data. Uh, we also uh, have an initial list of high priority quantities for data qu qu quality and uh, uncertainty. So uh, like, you know, the radar reflectivity, you know, the, uh, we have done a lot for uh, col uh, collaborate, you know, the ARM radar. Uh, we are also working on to address uncertainty in other, you know, uh, quantities at least in this table. Uh, I would like to stop here uh, for some questions if you have. Great, thank you, Shoshang. Um, I don't see any questions right now. I suggest people could use the chat or the Q&A if they have questions or contact uh, Hao Cheng or the other translators directly. Um, so why don't we move on to the next? Um, Our uh, next speaker is Chang Gai Kuang, the PI of uh, AMF3 going southeastern US. Great, uh, thanks, thanks. Yan Yan and Rob for inviting me to present kind of a summary from our breakout session yesterday afternoon. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's jump to the next slide. So I just want to give you a quick summary kind of of the high level messaging, right? And the messages that were received first and foremost, right? This is the first time ARM, ASR and a site science team are working together for an AMF deployment in this matter. What does that practically mean? That means that the kind of interaction and engagement right, between us, the community, ARM and ASR is going to look a little bit different from what a lot of people might have experienced in the past. Okay. So while this might present challenges up front, it also provides great opportunities for the community to provide their feedback to be implemented right, in the siting and deployment of this AMF. So our presentations from our breakout yesterday were divided into roughly two sections. One was providing background motivators and citing considerations for moving the AMF3 to the Southeast US. The second part focused mainly on high level Southeast US science drivers, right, related to land atmosphere interactions, aerosol and convective clouds. Now one theme and one message that came out out of all of these presentations and the related discussions were that uh, there was gonna be multi-scale heterogeneity, right? Looking at across all these different scientific topics, you know, and it was presented both as a challenge and as an opportunity. So I just want to remind, remind us again is that not only is this not a typical AMF deployment, it is not a typical AMF3 deployment, right? So this is going to be a five deployment, anticipated five year from 2023 to 2028. Our science, science proposal was funded in part because of land atmosphere interaction strengths, right? So that means that the looking at science drivers that look at how land atmosphere coupling impacts aerosol properties and processes and convective cloud onset is gonna be something that's gonna be important um, as a um, important as a science driver for where we cite AMF3. Uh, there was definitely a lot of chatter and a lot of volume about the need for distributed measurement networks and how the AMF3 Southeast US could be used as a platform for emerging measurement opportunities. And so the kind of the last thing kind of that we that we wanted to emphasize to the community is that our site science team are ambassadors and advocates for the site science. We are not gatekeepers. Right? The AMF3 Southeast US does not belong to the site science team, it belongs to the broader scientific community. Right. And so with that being said, this presents a great opportunity, right, for you as a scientific community to give us feedback um, to help inform the siting and the instrument prioritization. And you can do that uh, by sending us feedback to the Southeast US team at arm.gov email. The next slide, please. So during the, during our breakout, we kind of identified a number of challenges, issues and needs kind of associated with this uh, deployment and, uh, and also specifically looking at warm boundary layer processes. So a lot of our challenges and issues and needs are really flow, are flow down from what our site operation deployment looks like. If we're looking at a site operation beginning March 2023, right, then that really kind of fixes us in place about when we need to identify a site and when a site shortlist needs to be identified. And so given that that's kind of our background for um, deliverables and targets, right, our team is very busy um, crafting these science traceability matrices. So this is something that our team is doing, 
But at the same time, we also welcome feedback on these matrices as well. And so what these matrices are really broadly doing is are connecting articulated science drivers, the science questions, and then the required measurements. And then once we have the required measurements, we then flow that down then to, well, what are the required instruments and how do we prioritize them so that we can give ARM a list, right, about that, that's, that, that, can, that, is, that is science supported and community supported. So some of our other team activities are also related to working with Sandia National Lab on generation of these geographic information system maps. And so based upon whatever our siting considerations and constraints are, we can generate maps looking at different layers. And, and so we also welcome suggestions on map layers to look at for siting. And so just as shown here is, in a, is an example map layer of the Southeast US showing convective locations away from the coastline, right? With, within 100 kilometers of a surveillance precipitation radar. And these are the kind of maps that are informed by our science, but that we then share and work with the ARM siting in order to successfully deploy the AMF3 um, in the Southeast US. We'll go to the next slide, please. And then what I also wanted to, to share, share with this breakout is how are science questions related to all the operational considerations that we need to be thinking of. And so uh, I, I just posted a high level science driver from, from, our, science, from, our, from our science proposal is a question of what is the role of large scale versus mesoscale thermodynamic perturbation to the onset of shallow convection? Right? So that is our science driver, our science question. And there are a number of operational and instrument and sampling considerations that will inform how successfully we can target this question. So during, our, so, so, so during the discussion with our breakout, we, we talked about a number of things that will impact, right? How well we can answer these types of questions and target these kind of problems, right? The discussion ranged from, uh, you know, um, avoiding potential sea breeze influences on convection, right? So if that is a priority, then how does this inform Southeast US siting, right? Um, there was a lot of emphasis on distributed networks, right? So that will translate into supplemental sites around the central facility. So this question about what scale will they be distributed to? What kind of measurements will be made at those various sites? You know, temperature, moisture, eddy covariance, surface albedo. And then there's also some discussion about, well, what are optimal cloud sampling strategies, capabilities, right? What can we use in terms of multiple stereo cameras, cloud radar, and Doppler LiDAR to get at a more fuller 4D picture of the cloud field? And again, what are potential emerging technologies and ILPs that could support, right? Or, or that could be, or, 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 yeah, that could support the answering of this question. Can we go to the, my last slide, please? And so, uh, and so with, that, with that being said, I then want to just advertise to you uh, our, um, our, our email list. So feedback can come to us at scusteam at arm.gov. And we have further campaign information on our webpage. Thank you. Right, thank you. <laughs> Um, I don't see any questions specifically here, but um, let's so please get hold of um, Shanghai and the team um, if you want to have suggestions. Uh, they're in an important phase right now of setting up this deployment, and so input is more than welcome. Um, so, should we go on to the next uh, talk? Yeah, our next speaker is Dan Feldman. Um, he's the PI of uh, the sail um, field campaign. Although this is high altitude, but there is a few aspects is also strongly related to warm boundary layer process. Thank you, Dan. Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thanks, Yan. Thanks, Rob, for the invitation to present here today. Um, some of this, uh, for those of you who attended the breakout session yesterday, I might be familiar, but there are some specifics for the uh, warm boundary layer processes uh, working group that um, I'm delighted to present today. And just as uh, at a high level, I really look forward to uh, working with um, with as many of you as possible in this in the working group um, to understand the uh, the spring and summer um, uh, boundary layer processes because they are actually uh, really quite important for. Uh, for this uh, this area, so I changed my picture from a snow covered um, uh, snow covered uh, scene to uh, something in the the mid uh, fall, and um, and so it, there, there's you can see um, a lot of things, a lot of processes that are 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 taking place um, within this this picture. But okay, so let me talk. Oh, could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. 
Um, right. So uh, the SAIL campaign is a Service Atmosphere Integrated Field Laboratory um, campaign. Um, the background here is that there are uh, large uncertainties in atmospheric inputs um, to uh, mountainous watersheds uh, that complicate the development of hydrological models, the understanding of what water resources are now and what they would look like in the future. Um, some of these are actually really uh, directly tied into warm boundary layer processes. And so we really need to get a handle on this. Um, uh, the, uh, the SAIL campaign um, will be working directly with another a large uh, surface and subsurface group of researchers that are uh, funded as part of uh, the subsurface biogeochemistry research programs, watershed function SFA. And they provide a lot of context for this, um, this, uh, this deployment. Uh, they've been making measurements um, in, in uh, the East River watershed uh, for quite some time um, and for, for about five years now. Um, and they have uh, weather stations, they have um, uh, radiometers um, and a, a, a large uh, set of other types of observations that we can, can uh, build off of. Uh, the campaign will extend from uh, September of 2021 through June of 2023. Uh, it's in southwestern Colorado, um, uh, near the town of Crested Butte. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, this, this East River watershed is about 300 square kilometers, part of the upper Colorado River. Um, and we're trying to understand the, um, the, the dominant processes that govern energy and mass budgets so that they can uh, ultimately be represented in process models and inform our system models so that they have a better uh, a, a characterization of uh, water resources in, in, uh, now and into the future. And next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the AMF2 will have about three dozen instruments. And, uh, there'll be an aerosol um, a, a package, um, a solometer, TSI, radiometers, and also um, an X-band scanning precipitation radar from Colorado State University. So we'll have a lot of the tools to um, hopefully properly instrument um, the, the models, actually, at the end of the day. So um, yeah, could you go to the next slide, please? All right, so, um, so with respect to warm boundary uh, layer processes, I, I would argue at, at the minimum, we have about 40% uh, of, the, of the science objectives of SAIL are related to uh, warm boundary layers um, uh, processes, although uh, it could easily be argued that 80% uh, of the science objectives are related to, uh, to warm boundary layer processes. We're interested in um, really the, uh, what governs the heterogeneity and precipitation. Um, and, uh, and we'll have a, a radar to be able to do that. Um, uh, with respect to aerosols, um, there are um, large impacts in the atmosphere and on the surface. Sometimes those vary. They also um, aerosols impact precipitation in, um, in uh, some, some obvious and non-obvious ways. Um, and we'll have uh, a suite of measurements to characterize that. And um, ultimately these provide, con um, th there are, um, we're looking to understand the controls on surface fluxes and the surface energy balance, how that varies uh, over uh, across seasons um, and, and ultimately impacts um, uh, the hydrological output of this uh, system. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in the spring, um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there are pretty dramatic changes in uh, surface fluxes. Um, we see um, an evolution of the surface layer, uh, land atmospheric interactions, strong advective fluxes. These govern snowmelt dynamics and um, just at a very high level, um, we are, a large range of models are unable to get uh, snow melt right. They uh, overestimate snow melt. Um, models from earth system level to uh, sort of regionally refined to downscaled uh, to any basically um, most models that you can think of are are, uh, are are not quite able to get the snow melt right and uh, that's kind of kind of an issue so that's something that we'd like um, really uh, this group's help with um, next slide please Um, oh, I guess this didn't quite show up right. But um, so uh, as well, um, I did want to indicate that we're on the uh, kind of the bleeding edge of the uh, North American monsoon. Um, the uh, previous um, intensive studies like uh, the North American monsoon experiment uh, were uh, <laughs> a little over a thousand miles away. Um, and, uh, and so, um, you know, so we're, we're, we're looking to, uh, to, uh, to understand um, the, uh, uh, you know, 
really what's governing this northern edge of the North American monsoon. Um, and I just show a, uh, on the left, it's a little bit hard to see, but um, this is a, a, a climatology of, uh, of, of uh, Worf's uh, description of uh, precipitation uh, in, the, in the warm season uh, relative uh, to, uh, to a reanalysis product called PRISM. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and, and I would also note that summer precipitation has an outside impact on watershed hydrology and also gross primary, pr primary productivity. So there are a lot of different interactions here that, um, that, that really understanding the, um, the, um, the development of the boundary layer um, and, with respect to uh, radiation and precipitation are, will be really uh, quite important. Um, next slide, please. Um, and there are all, there's some um, low-hanging fruit. Um, you know, we heard a little bit about 3D radiation from uh, earlier, and um, and uh, you know, I note that um, that uh, the 3D effects uh, of terrain are generally not included in uh, models, um, and uh, in, a, in a wide variety of, of uh, process models and earth system models. And so, so these are things that we can include. There are also some um, less obvious impacts um, uh, for radiation radiation that we need to to, to consider modeling. Um, and so, I, I show the on, on the right here the the sky view uh, factor uh, for uh, for this East River watershed. Um, there's a lot of uh, variability in that and that can can have uh, impacts in in the spring and summer so um and next slide please just my last one um so uh really you know i'd like to reach out to this community um really understand your science interests we um have a couple of key objectives that we're pursuing but um you know this is a, is a group effort uh, especially with in the warm season, we'll have uh, two springs. We'll have the opportunity uh, to to think about um, hypothesis development from uh, data from the first spring um, to test in the second one, um, and you know we'll we'll have a, have a, a full summer to uh, to measure um, measure some monsoonal processes. So um, please reach out to me. Um, we also uh, have a mailing list. Um, and I can uh, put you on that if you if you're interested. We're going to also have a, a workshop coming up in uh, towards the end of the summer, um, and so uh, so we'd like to uh, hear more uh, from you. And um, uh, uh, looking forward to collaboration. Thanks. Great, thank you, Dan. That's really really interesting campaign. Um, please do reach out to Dan. I think we're going to need to move on in the spirit of timing here. Um, so, oh, yeah. Next, yeah, our next speaker is um, um, Pakita Zubdima. Pakita, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Pakita is going to talk about uh, short wave absorbing aerosol and their interaction with large scale environment. The yeah. Summary. Yeah, uh, thank you, Yu Yang and um, Rob. So, yeah, we had this session on. Um, Tuesday afternoon, and um, it, it's mainly focused on the uh, LASIK campaign that ended on uh, Ascension Island in the Southeast Atlantic in October 2017. So that was almost two years ago, three years ago. So we're um, in a vibrant um, analysis phase, and um, that was reflected in, in, the, in the session. Uh, the session was split kind of half aerosols and half aerosol clouds clouds so i'm, I'm highlighting here the uh, presentations that focused more on um, aerosol cloud interactions uh, the first one by listed here by allison colo took back trajectories from ascension island uh, back to continental africa and integrated that with maritu and looked at the uh, radiative heating um, as it evolved over that uh, transport from um, continental Africa out to Ascension. And uh, the second one by Paul Barrett. So he was representing the aircraft um, UK Clarify project. So they were based on the island from um, you know, August, September 2017. And that was a very um, productive for us. Um, they did some you know, dedicated flybys of the uh, MF1 site that is helping us understand those data sets, but also, you know, scientifically they were, you know, sampling around the island. So we're, um, uh, you know, coming up with in, in, um, 
a, a useful synergy of those um, of that analysis. And you know, what LASIK really has to offer there is the uh, full-on uh, diurnal, diurnal sampling when their um, aircraft flights were mostly in the mid-morning and the mid-afternoon. Uh, this was followed by a talk by uh, Jinghao Shang. So he um, is looking at the um, uh, low cloud response to uh, changes in the aerosol cloud vertical structure over the biomass burning uh, season. So the aerosol tends to be more um, localized in the boundary layer at the early part of the biomass burning season and then moves to be in the free troposphere. So the um, uh, the interactions with the clouds um, change uh, during that time. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the radio sons um, from Ascension are very helpful for that. Uh, this was followed by a presentation by um, Pablo Said looking at the um, kappa parameter from, you know, deriving kappa from the LASIK observations to um, use to assess his wharf. CAM5 models and um, look at the aerosol, uh, you know, further refine um, the model understanding of the aerosol indirect effect. And uh, last, we had three uh, present, there's three um, process modeling studies uh, taking place looking at the stratocumulus um, transition in the presence of smoke. And um, Michael Diamond, Anne Friedland, and Jan Kozel all gave um, presentations on these. Um, Michael's is uh, taking a time period when there's a lot of aircraft data um, and looking at trajectories that end at ascension. So there's, there's a lot of data that can be integrated into a um, ILIAS study that's being uh, driven by the wharf chem um, simulations that Pablo has done. And uh, Anne Friedland is um, using LES studies to provide insight into their, um, you know, how their GIS model is performing. So she has a whole ensemble of um, trajectories across the Southeast Atlantic. And Young Kozel is looking at an open cell, um, a pocket of open cell case that's been uh, documented by the Clarify team. And uh, we follow this with about a 30 minute discussion on um, how to, uh, um, well, uh, so these, these process modeling studies have kind of been happening on their own. And now, it, you know, it's a kind of a good point to um, talk about how those can be um, integrated more with the data sets and, you know, what, what we could do. Um, to build on these. Um, so we, uh, yeah, so, so um, this post-session discussion is, um, well, um, we, we had some ideas and uh, Anne Friedland's um, session on the uh, observation guided model development also produced some further ideas. So we'll um, continue that conversation with a, a, a meeting in, in the fall to um, see where we want to go with that. And um, yeah, you can kind of read the slide, but there's a special issue where um, a lot of the work is coming out in. And uh, I also want to mention a um, session at the AMS annual meeting coming up on the Southeast Atlantic that's being uh, lead convened by Michael Diamond at U of Washington. Right, thank you, Paquita. That was excellent. Now, it looks like there's good ongoing work there, collaborations across a lot of different teams. So, should we move on to the next, the final one in this um, updates session? Um, the final update is from um, Lasso. And I should just point out there there are a couple of questions for you, Dan, in the uh, regarding sale in the chat. Yep, great, thanks. I'm working on it. Thanks. Yeah, and and the last update is given by uh, Bill Gusperson. 
Hello, everybody. This is Bill. Um, and I apologize if you've seen this already. It's kind of hard to know who's in what sessions. Um, we've got a lot of work going on with Lasso this year that we're excited about and want to get kind of the relevant pieces out to the different working groups. Um, so I've just got this one slide to give you a quick update on Lasso. Um, we've got about uh, 17 cases we'll be releasing for the 2019 season that we're kind of in the last throes of getting out the door right now. Um, so that's, those will be available for you later this summer. Um, and actually, uh, I don't have to spend too much time on the second bullet, the adding the high frequency observations. Uh, Xiao Cheng mentioned this, he had a whole slide dedicated to it. Um, so basically we'll have uh, the raw or closer to raw frequency data now available that we use within the LASSO bundles. And that'll be available in like the one to 10 minute uh, frequency now. Um, so that's something several of you have asked for and we're kind of excited to get that out the door now. Um, and then the other thing we're gonna be releasing this year is a sidecar product with the, fogs, the COGS photogrammetry uh, cloud masking. Um, so this is uh, something we're looking at and comparing it to the Kaiser r school cloud masks for the time height uh, clouds as they blow over the central facility. Um, and you can see in this plot on the right here that we use the COGS data set for the observations, the LES model verifies much better. Um, so this is a comparison of the 2D net skill cloud masking um, that we use within LASSO. Um, so that's something that's pretty exciting. We're, we'll have that available for 2018 and 2019 cases at this point. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to highlight, um, the next major bullet down there, we did find some bugs in a couple of our forcing data sets. Uh, we recently became aware of an issue in the variational analysis. Um, and we have received a fixed version of that. We'll be reprocessing those impacted cases and releasing those later this year. Um, and then we also discovered a factor of 10 uh, mistake in the vertical velocity for the ECMWF forcings um, that impact all of the ECMWF cases. Um, so we'll be reprocessing those and re-releasing those. So if you're a user of those, uh, you can contact Andy Vogelman or myself at lasso.arm.gov to get more information. So the other things we wanted to just make people aware of, and this is where we're really spending a lot of our energy now, is we're spinning down the shallow convection and putting it on a hiatus after this season released for 2019 so that we can spend more time uh, in our cacti development. So we're really spinning up cacti right now. We've got a lot of exciting stuff going on there. Um, and I just also wanted to mention that we're going through the budget process right now for FY21 and we're excited to let people know that we're asking for uh, funding to start developing the maritime scenario at ACNA. So that's something we talked a little bit about um, during the ENA session um, earlier this week. Um, and we'll be starting to look in more detail at this later this year. And most of the work for this will be in 2021. So that's just some, uh, a quick update. And if there's questions, feel free to reach out and we can uh, see what's up. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so Bill, I have a question. So is the effort of ACE ENA development and CACDI will be parallel? A little bit. Um, so during 2020, we're primarily focusing on CACDI. So all the observation, processing, designing the configurations for the LES and the data bundles, um, that's mainly happening this year, but the simulations are gonna be so expensive for CACDI that we expect them to extend into 2021 and probably substantially into 2021 before we're able to release those and get them into the archive for everybody to use. Um, so while we're waiting for the Cacti LES to run, uh, we wanna start working on ENA because so we'll have essentially uh, staff resources available at that point. We're just kind of twiddling our thumbs waiting for the LES. Um, so it's a great opportunity to start them concurrently, mainly in 2021 at that point. Thank you. So now we are moving to the discussion session, especially feedback on the cloud precipitation measurement and um, um, the, the, the metrics that uh, Christine Chu helped us put together um, on the one boundary layer measurement, especially focusing on PBL turbulence and uh, uh, warm clouds. Christine Chu? Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk about what has been discussed in that uh, group. And also we leave the decadal plan here, just in case you, if you have any comments or feedback, I'm sure that we are, uh, we are happy to hear about that too. Can you do the next slide, please? 
Um, so I hope you have had a chance to attend Anne's talk. I think she gave a, a great overview and also covered um, a lot of the details. But I, today, I just wanted to focus on one thing that is sort of a develop and maintain a public list of a measurement or analysis gaps that require either a specific additional investments or integration of a PI or external data sets or codes, as well as a method for gauging community support. So I, I thought that this paragraph uh, probably Anne wrote or Jean Anne wrote is quite a good uh, summarize or summary that what we are going to achieve in this uh, 15 minutes or so. So I, will, I am responsible for boundary layer structure and shallow cloud microphysics. And sorry about the typo, uh, apparently I think math a lot. Um, so what I would like to emphasize here though is I consider this opportunity is to provide my service and my expertise, but I hope to emphasize that recommendations need to come from working group. So all of you actually play a much more important role than I do. And so your voice is super important. So I hope you can engage the discussion in the next 10 minutes or so. So we come up with a table that hope to link science question to the activities or to all the elements that provide a clear pathway or per clear math to tie the science question and the, the, the goal. So what we have there is a start with a science question and then we list a, a lot of, not a lot, a few of uh, problem and roadblocks and then show if we re remove the roadblock, what kind of impact we can achieve and also research elements involved and if there is some measurement gaps and needs some retrieval algorithm, for example, or a special observation strategy, what kind of, uh, is a mature or what is the maturity and the readiness? And also if there is a solution and recommendation, and we hope to outline what kind of a timeline that, it, that is, so the uh, DOE or ARM program manager can have a better sense how big or how troubles or how problematic this solution needs to implement. And also, uh, finally, we hope to provide a very clear roadmap to modeling. So I'd like to pause here for a second and wonder if I can ask you to take a screenshot here, because I want to come back here and then ask you, does the, the table contain key elements to show a clear map from science question to improvements of our understanding and modeling. If not, what is missing? And I hope that I can pin down who has some sort of a feedback. And so I will come back here again. Next slide, please. So we had a workshop you probably heard of it. And then I put the report, just my part. So I put the report there so you can read it and then see what has been discussed. And then the action plans for that workshop for this specific uh, part is to solicit, uh, solicit input from breakout section. Apparently at that time we didn't know that everything will be virtual, but just let you know what, uh, what has been uh, sort of listed as action plans. And the second bullet point is really to collect the input from working groups to clarify and identify barriers or recommendation because uh, we collected some sort of uh, barriers but when we had when we were in workshop we don't really remember who brought it up or what's the context so it's not really entirely clear to us so if you happen to raise up that those barriers that maybe this time for you to clarify a little bit. So I just put here, for example, the surface inhomogeneity and the need for ocean measurements at ENA and also adaption and development of a remote sensing techniques for high latitude sites. And I put that here is because some of the techniques are actually probably developed from the, this group. And I think you may have, uh, you may be interested in that bit of uh, the discussion as well. And that's why I include it here. Next slide, please. So I just want to list uh, what's the, what are the roadblocks we have been listed for shallow cloud microphysics. So I put 
uh, I put two bullet points here. So lack of a robust drop number concentration and joint cloud and drizzle property. And also observation of a clouds with low and large liquid water path. And also observations for vertical velocity from cloud base to in cloud. And I think that's not just this work, uh, working group, probably linked to a deep convection cloud group as well. And observations of a small scale turbulence, entrainment and mixing. And the other issues about like a large scale vertical motion and quality and availability of aerosol measurements and also site um, are represented in, in, in terms of a simple aerosol cloud conditions and decoupling with boundary there. So we will come back here again to see if we miss anything or do you agree that is a sort of a major roadblock for the shallow cloud microphysics? Next slide, please. And we also have this, uh, just a couple for boundary layer structure. So the main issues is to the difficulty in characterizing the PBL height, which I don't quite understand because we have a, quite a lot of a product. I understand that definition will be different, but that probably requires some discussions from this group. And also difficulty in characterizing the structure robustly. And also the 3D structure and spatial context are important on the kilometer scale. Again, this seems a little bit unclear, so that's why I will put it here and I hope to get some feedback from you. And two unclear issues is the uh, marine boundary layer analysis at ENA requires ocean surface properties. In the workshop, we have a different opinions about this point. So if you think it's important, probably it's a time for you to speak up. And also continuation and, and the data sets. And we didn't really have the time to talk about this uh, a lot in the workshop, but just leave it here. Next slide, please. So I also, there's a few sessions and topics that talk uh, was discussed in the workshop. I didn't attend all of, you, uh, all of them, but I thought to list here. So in that sense, you can have a bigger picture what this group has been talking about. So there are also convection and series so that is led by Mike Jensen and mixed phase and ice processes led by Matt. And you have heard about regime classification from Anne's talk. And also I thought the two bullet points here may be related to you is the short term measurements. And basically is talking about the scanning cloud radar and LIDAR the spectral because it seems a very important thing, but somehow it's quite complex and then not many, many people to use it. So the short term, I'm sorry, that's a high volume data reduction, but the short term measurement is talking about the scan strategy and that uh, probably uh, I don't know if you have any thought about that. Is that uh, where you recommend some measurements to have a very special uh, scan strategy? And but that is probably not good for the long term strategy. And the high volume data reduction is the Doppler spectra thing. And some of you may have it working on the Doppler spectra or cloud radar uh, spectra. And so I just wanted to let you be aware of that is a discussion as well. Okay, so next please. So you will find all the table. I'm not going to talk through uh, uh, these tables, but can I encourage you to look through and then to see uh, if you want to contribute to this table. Like I say, without your engagement, this process won't be successful. So I, I really hope to uh, you, you can let us know what you think about this roadblocks and the, the table and what's the solution and what's the roadmap to the model. So Yunyang, if you can uh, switch back to the second slide, I think. Uh, no, the previous one. Okay, so can I ask if this table, the science question, problem, impact, blah, 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 to roadmap to modeling, do you think that capture all the key elements? If not, are you willing to tell us? So I don't see, I don't know uh, if this is going to work, but can you raise your hand if you have something to say? And then so I can take a snapshot in the participants list 
and then we can contact you later. Or in the last five minutes, you, you can feel free to speak up. But can I just get a survey first? Do you think this match, the table here, really capture the key elements? If not, can you talk to us? If you are willing to talk to us, can you raise your hand? Yunyan, can you see any hands? I'm, no, I didn't see. I don't um, see any, which means you've done a great job of. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you think there this, a, this. Uh, there is a question from uh, Varenja. Um, Hi, Christine. It will be very nice if we can have Buoy measurement at ENA site. The surface latent heat fluxes is important in producing decoupling. Okay, so it, that's great. So that I can cut and paste, and then we can. I will hand it to a working group chair, and then we inside the working group. Perhaps we can have a small group to discuss that. Will that be doable and acceptable? Yeah. Okay. So let um, me try. Yes. That was also uh, echoed by uh, Bill Gustafson in the chat, um, talking about how its surface fluxes are important for lasso in the ACNA scenario. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. So perhaps we can change it then. So if you think this is great to cover everything, can you raise your hand? <laughs> so yes. yeah, please raise Ooh, your hand. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Okay, so can we move to the next slide? And next. Yeah, this one, oh, no, thanks. So I'd like to uh, sort of uh, break down this list a little bit. If you are interested in providing feedback um, on the number concentration retrieval or cloud re drizzle retrieval, can you raise your hand? Christine, are you? Yeah, I, I can see it. So I can take a screenshot. Okay. Great. And then if you are interested in providing feedback on observations of uh, clouds with a large and low liquid water path, can you raise your hand, please? There's one more, yeah. There's one more. Uh, Jen. Yeah. Don't 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 put down your hands yet. Okay. All right. If you are interested in providing feedback on observation of a vertical velocity from cloud base to in cloud, can you raise your hand, please? Yeah. Can you keep raising your hands until? Yeah. Until I sit down, because I need time to take a screenshot. Okay. And if you're interested in observations of a small scale turbulence and entrainment and mixing, can you raise your hand, please? There's many more, yeah. That's great. Give me a second here. Give me a second here. Okay. Christine, that yeah. some of the panelists are apparently not able to raise their hand, so there are some notes from them in the chat. Okay, uh, I'll, co right. I'll share that with you later. Thank you. And issues about large scale vertical motion. Um, motion? No? I think the second bullet maybe have a more interest. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hand. I will. Oops. Uh, quality and availability of uh, aerosol measurements. Chen Qing raised his hand. Larry. Okay, site uh, whatever said poor aerosol condition. I think this probably can link to aerosol. Uh, Yunyan, can you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. How about the boundary there structure just in general, I think. The difficulty in okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so now 
Mark, you are, you are late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now I wanted to open the floor to, for you to speak up um, or just answer some Q&A or you, if you have any comments of, uh, about the, the Cato plan. Yeah, Jim, are you there? Jim, are there? Yeah. I think I am here, yes. Oh, I great. Do you have specific uh, things that you want people to feedback from this group on the Cato plan, on the one boundary layer? Yeah. Um, well, so, Right, so I would encourage people to look at the document to see what items are currently captured there and then identify, I mean, as we've been trying to capture, what are the, uh, the most critical um, needs from this group? And, and as I think I outlined in this, Christine outlined also why those are important, you know, what the science goals are and to the extent that there's a solution to that, what is the maturity of that? What we want to try to capture through this uh, doc, this um, matrix is really a full picture of opportunities to um, to move the science forward. So we are working on a, a more form a more um, formal mechanism to have this conversation where information can be submitted. So I hope that will be coming in the next few months. But in the meantime, you can certainly provide that to Christine or to Yunyan or Rob. Um, I maybe think that's all I'll say at the moment, except yeah, to say if, if there are suggestions on the on the structure, that's also of interest. Great. Thank you. Uh, so please do reach out uh, to either Christine or Jim on the decadal survey. Um, the other the fun one final thing, I know we're over time now. So uh, one final thing um, is the fall working group uh, breakout idea. Uh, I know Paquita mentioned there's interest in a fall working group meeting for uh, focus on LASIK in the solving aerosol area. But um, the, we know there are another, a number of people who submitted uh, requests for breakouts that weren't able to be accommodated in this meeting. So um, if there are any, please feel free to either chat them to here so that we can capture those if people are interested or um, just let us know one way or another. Um, if you had, do have concrete plans for moving forward for to, to do those breakouts or, or, or other ones in the in fall um, for a fall group. They're still somewhat fluid as to how we organize those, but um, but we'd like to know kind of what level of interest there is from, from groups planning those. Yeah, either um, more uh, topical area specific, or you like uh, a very general working group meeting um, with um, like half day workshop or, or two day in a row, half day workshop like that, just let us know. Um, And wow. also for those uh, panelists that you would like to uh, feedback on the metrics that Christine um, put it up that you could leave it in the chat and send it to us. We'll record that. Yeah. Maybe it would be a good time to wrap up now and uh, thank all the presenters uh, for keeping to time. It's I think we did well to get through all that in, in the time allowed. Um, and thanks uh, to Aral for helping to kind of moderate this and make sure this meeting all went well. Um, it's been uh, been it's been great. It was run very smoothly in general. I mean, I think that the the ways in which we interact in these meetings is quite um, evolving in time, and it's all new to everyone. Um, uh, but we're learning as we go along, and there's more and more functionality being put into these. I did hear that there are plans for a LIDAR breakout in fall. Um, also one potentially focused on stratocumulus transitions. I know there was a was plans for a, a marine boundary layer kind of focused, marine low cloud focused session. Uh, there may be ways to kind of combine those into good ways to meetings. If not, do you have anything else to say, Yunyan? 
No, yeah, thank you for all the uh, speakers for submitting your talks and make this so organized. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, Shaima or Sadi, do you have any final words to us? I just want to thank everyone for attending and I definitely really want to thank uh, Yunyan and Rob for running such a great session. Just echo Shaima's comments. Thank you all.